welcome. Good evening, everybody. I'm Debbie Lunder, chair of the Friends of the Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you and introduce our speaker, Kathleen Coleman, the 2017-18 Eleanor Lunder Founder Circle member in the School of Historical Studies. Thank you, Eleanor, for your support at the Founder Circle level, which is so important to the Institute, as is all the gifts from all the friends. Dr. Coleman's home institution is Harvard University, where she is the James Loeb Professor of the Classics and Senior Research Curator of the Harvard Art Museums. Born and raised in Zimbabwe, Dr. Coleman studied at the University of Cape Town and the University of Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and then earned a DPhil from Oxford. Before joining the Harvard faculty, Dr. Coleman taught at the University of Cape Town and held the chair of Latin at Trinity College, Dublin. Her research interests include Latin literature, especially Flavian poetry, the history and culture of the early empire, arena spectacles, Roman punishment, Latin epigraphy, and Roman mosaics. Dr. Coleman serves on the editorial boards for several journals, including the American Journal of Philology. She is internationally recognized for her scholarship and teaching and is widely published. Her current book-length projects are a monograph on Roman public executions for Oxford University Press and a study of arena spectacles for Yale University Press. At the Institute this year, she is writing a book about a Roman child the son of two former slaves who died aged 11 years, five months, and 12 days, having delivered a 45-line extempore poem in Greek at an international competition in Rome in the presence of the Emperor Domitian in 94 CE. Dr. Coleman has participated in several radio programs and television doctor documentaries about the Roman amphitheater, her subject tonight. We are delighted that she will give this talk titled The Virtues of Violence, Amphitheaters, Gladiators, and the Roman System of Values. Dr. Coleman will take questions following the talk. And please join me now in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Coleman. Debbie, thank you very much for that very Nice introduction. Eleanor, thank you for bringing me here. Everybody, especially the friends, thank you so much for coming. And I did want to say that I'm so struck by the presence of the friends of the IAS. You're not simply giving us physical support. You're giving us your presence and your commitment. And that makes for a community. And I see some of you at lunch and occasionally at dinners. And it's very striking to me that we're a community of scholars that's much broader than simply the people researching here. I like that a lot. Thank you for being here this evening. And I have a deliberate paradox, obviously, in my title, The Virtues of Violence. And that is because I want us to think really hard about why a practice that we find so reprehensible, looking back over 2,000 years, must not have seemed reprehensible at the time. There are certain dissenting voices. I'm not going to talk about those. There are, unfortunately, not many of them. A few pagan philosophers, and then subsequently, a few Christian dissenters. Not as many as one would hope. And they don't seem to have primarily objected to the inhumanity of the arena, so much as the fact that going to it interfered with one's self-control. We've just had the Super Bowl. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you get sucked in. So what I want to do this evening is look at a little bit of the evidence. We have almost no literary treatments of the arena except the occasional remark here and there because the dignity that the senatorial authors thought should pervade their literature was not consonant with the violence of the arena or the hype of the arena. So we have very few remarks, really, in literary sources about arena spectacles, but we do have a huge amount of material evidence. A few inscriptions, so we have some words, but a lot of image, like the one on my title slide, which we'll look at again uh, in a few minutes. And what I'm doing is focusing on the 
um, period, which is the early empire, where we have the most evidence. I'm not going to talk about the origins of the games because we really don't know very much about them. Other than that, gladiators were originally displayed at funerals as a way of honoring an aristocrat who had died. But they soon became a political tool and a way of garnering popularity. So that is really what I want to look at, is the high uh, period, about three centuries in the empire, when this was a pervasive practice throughout society, in which the entire commercial and political nexus was implicated. And I don't think the Romans could have unraveled it, even if they had wanted to. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, well, how come it ever ended? And there we may be looking at primarily um, economic issues, because these were very expensive, as I'm going to try and demonstrate. So let me um, <coughs> now uh, give you just one more tip before I start, and that is I've decided to try and show you as many recent finds as possible. Uh, because, you know, people say at dinner parties, you do classics? I say, yes. They say, do you do research? I say, yeah. And they say, but don't we know everything? I mean, no! <laughs> we don't. Plus, it's all coming out of the ground all the time. We can't keep up with it. So I want to show you a few of our uh, most recent finds. So let's start off with a map. Everywhere you see color on the screen, the Romans were. And everywhere the Romans were, amphitheater spectacles were. Although some of the structures in which they were performed were very primitive. And all we've got left are little mounds of earth with post holes. And those would be far too drab to show you on a Friday evening. So instead, we're going to start with the most famous <laughs> of the amphitheaters, the Colosseum. And that is not Gaius Sallustius Crispus Coleman, who lives at 248 von Neumann Drive. That is um, one of the Roman moggies who inhabit the modern Colosseum. And that's the good side. The bad side is much more instructive, actually, because you can see how it was built. It's these concentric circles, which enable corridors to give access to the staircases that actually support the seating. It's a very, very economical design, and it's still the design of all football stadia today, um, if you look carefully. We will be looking in a moment at the, in the basement down there, but for, just for, the, for, um, for now, I want us to look very briefly at the cross-section so that you can see what I was saying that uh, if you come in through one of these arcade oops, I beg your pardon come in through an arcade. Um, at, the, uh, at the outside, you will then be funneled up the appropriate set of stairs so that you sit in the right section. And this is one of the features of an ancient amphitheater that develops very early, that it enables the correct portions of society to sit safely segregated from the less important people. And that means that actually an amphitheater does show us a microcosm of Roman society. So that um, the reason why I'm spending a little time on the architecture is to show you that by looking at the way they put their energy into what is actually probably the most sophisticated of all ancient buildings has to be an index of the importance of what happened there to the society as a whole. So um, you can guess, I'm sure, without any prompting from me, who sits, sits right up at the top under that roof. It's, of course, the women and the slaves. But uh, everybody else has got uh, more appropriate seating further down. And everybody went. They even had separate areas for children uh, and their minders. <coughs> so the ancient image, which is more telling, really, than anything, than anything modern, you see a coin here, which may not even have been actual currency. It may have been something more like a commemorative medallion. And it has every detail on something about the size of a modern quarter. And you can see both outside and inside simultaneously because of Roman perspective. And you can even see the four-horse chariot, like the one you can still see over St. Mark's in Venice, which is over the main doorway. You can see all four stories, the square windows at the top alternating with the shields that must have flashed in the sun, 
the masts that would have held up the awning, and inside the 45,000 people who would have fitted in there, and in the middle you see the emperor's special seating area, which has been raised up on that coin. It would, of course, been right down by the arena, so it would see all the action. But it's been raised up for us so that we can see him presiding over this spectacle. And there's great political capital made out of the construction of the Colosseum by the Flavian emperors when it was opened in the year 80. Here is a later medallion which has a very telling uh, legend around the edge, which you can read with me, Munificentia Gordiani Aug, short for Augusti, the munificence of the Emperor Gordian. It had burnt down, or part of it had burnt down, uh, in the early third century. And amid all the stresses of that century, the emperor found the resources to put that up again because it demonstrated his generosity and his care for his people. And this is one of the virtues of these violent spectacles, that they can demonstrate the care of the impresario for his people. And we see this playing out in every tiny little community throughout the empire when the local baron, who's a big important frog in a very small pool, will spend his money on four pairs of gladiators and two bears or something like that. Then he gets a big statue in the town square because of this generosity. So this is an outlet. These spectacles are an outlet for the wealth, the demonstration of the wealth and the standing in society of the most important people. Now, if we move on from here, uh, we will see a modern impression. There are some details that are wrong, uh, such as, for instance, these archways around the arena floor. But I like uh, to show you this because it gives an impression of the scale of the place. It shows you the, oopsie, sorry, I must stop doing this. It shows you the awning at the top. And uh, except I'm sure it wasn't ever as taut as that. I'm sure it flapped like crazy. And it also shows you the scenery in the arena, which we know from literary sources uh, would have sometimes been erected. Because of the verisimilitude, the Romans love making things match. And the verisimilitude of having little hillocks and water sources and so on made, I'm sure, the beast spectacles look much more realistic. Good. Now let's look briefly at the basement, which is two stories deep, actually six meters deep. And um, that's, it's divided into two levels. And you can see how it worked. We have uh, cages on the lower level, which um, have uh, <coughs> a grill across the front. And that means that then the three-sided cage can be raised to the next level, and then, with an open side on the fourth side, whatever was in that cage can be encouraged, probably by slaves with flares, to be uh, driven along this platform and then up through a trapdoor to pop into the arena like magic. We can watch Animal Planet and that kind of thing. The Romans brought the animals to them, right? And we have these remarkable inscriptions suggesting that the beast trade was really very widely dispersed. The attrition must have been simply horrific. There's been recent research done comparing the uh, Roman statistics, such as we have, with um, the importing of animals from Africa to the zoos of Europe in the 19th century. And the rate of attrition uh, must have been even worse, probably, in the, Roman, in the Roman period. But you were seeing the animals actually in action, not on a calendar or something, but actually in action in this artificial space in the center of the city, and not only the center of Rome, but as I said earlier, throughout the entire empire. So, <clears throat> what about those gladiators? Well, we know that they were quartered next door uh, to uh, the arena. In the case of Rome, the big Ludus Magnus was built uh, by Domitian right next to the Colosseum. The one, my favorite, my first choice for the next excavation is the tunnel that leads from the Ludus Magnus to the Colosseum. It must be absolutely full of graffiti. Um, 
<laughs> I need to see those. And then uh, we have another of the, um, <coughs> of the training schools down here, the Ludus Matutinus, most likely for beast fighters. We have already excavated part of the training arena in the Ludus Magnus. The gladiators were professionals, but they were slaves. And this is an important feature of the virtues of violence because those people have no standing, they have no status as persons. They are property, and therefore whatever can be done to them. And as uh, property, they can um, <coughs> be deployed however the owner wishes. But they were very valuable. This is the paradox. They were very valuable. We have a legal text from the second century where a lawyer is trying to demonstrate the difference between hire and purchase. And he says, think of the Roman amphitheater. If you rent gladiators for your show and you can send one back in an okay shape to his barracks, you'll pay 20 denarii for him. But if you kill him, you pay 1,000 denarii and basically you've bought him. So instantly you can see the pressure not to kill gladiators because the mock-up is phenomenal if the guy <laughs> dies. <laughs> they're property. They are property. And yet, as I said, they are professionals. They must have been very highly trained. They must have had relatively decent living conditions if they were going to be in you know, good physical shape. And they, of course, would have gained some form of status within their community, and on their tombstones there is no sign of shame. Their gladiatorial profession is boasted about just as prominently as if they were a bricklayer or a bootmaker or any other ancient profession. That's part, again, of the paradox of the status of the gladiator in Roman society. If they were not actually slaves, they could be assimilated to the status of slaves if they wanted to sign up for the arena, which may seem yet a further paradox. But it might have been a way of avoiding debt, because if you can't own anything as a gladiator, as a slave, you cannot owe anything. Now, here is, as far as I know, the only representation we have of a gladiator in training. Now, when you go to the beach, if it's windy, you need one of those umbrellas with a big, solid base so that it won't tip over in the wind. And that's basically what this guy is practicing against. There's the post, and there's the big, solid base, and he is practicing his sword strokes, and he's a right-hander, as you can see. It's the equivalent of the punch bag in the gym. They're everywhere in the ancient world, gladiators. They're on every conceivable surface. These two lamps are the smallest, most inexpensive items you would have in a Roman household. On the left, you can see an actual gladiatorial scene. It's noteworthy that one gladiator is kneeling and the other one is erect. This is the moment you're constantly seeing represented, the moment of defeat, the critical moment, what's going to happen to the defeated gladiator. And then on the right, you have a lamp which merely has gladiatorial equipment on it. There's no figural scene. There are just swords, shields, and helmets. I did something two summers ago I'm never, ever going to do again. I did a catalog. It was awful. <laughs> I did a catalog of these lamps. And I did make an interesting discovery. I had almost 100 examples, and I've discovered that the most common equipment is the equipment of the Thracian style of gladiator with the bent sword uh, and his opponent with the straight sword. And those are the only two gladiatorial fighting styles that have fan clubs in the ancient world. So I think that these lamps may have been made for the fan market. I'm not completely sure. Now, here are those styles, okay? You start with your underpants and you move from there, okay? <laughs> this is the Thracian, the guy I mentioned with the bent sword. 
I didn't understand what that was for until my friend Marcus Junkelmann outside Munich, who has his own troop of gladiators, is one of these reconstruction archaeologists, put on a show for me. And then I discovered that that bent sword is so that you can get behind your opponent's shoulder and hopefully get into this muscle here. That will really disable your opponent. Um, and <clears throat> the one style that's easy to recognize, which I want us to focus on now, is the retiarius, because he's the most vulnerable guy. He has no um, armor whatsoever except for a shoulder guard on his left shoulder. But he's equipped with a trident, a net, and a short dagger. The lack of, protect of protection, no helmet, no shield, no nothing, means, of course, he's very vulnerable, but he's quick. And that's the other thing I learned from uh, Marcus's display. This guy fights that guy, the secutor, who is heavily protected, as you can see. Great big shield, helmet, uh, big greaves, etc. But he's slow. And through this visor, he can see almost nothing. So <laughs> almost nothing. And it's also very stuffy under that helmet. And at Marcus's display in his girlfriend's paddock, the poor secutor was trying to follow the retiaris jumping about like that. And he was had to turn his head like this because he could hardly see anything. And that is another of the virtues of violence, is pitting these positives against the negatives, the advantages against the disadvantages. The Romans obviously loved that. The quick, vulnerable guy and the heavily protected but very, very encumbered fellow. How are the odds going to pan out? If you put a bull against a bear, who's going to win? The claws or the horns? That kind of thing. We see that constantly, this competitive streak in Roman society, which is so prominent. OK, so if you can um, recognize the retiarius, then you'll be able to uh, enjoy some of the sides that are going to follow. Remarkable. In the year 2000, at Kelis, which is modern Ismant el Karab in Egypt, which is way west in Egypt, way, 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 way from the Nile, they found this glass deposit. It was all smashed, of course, so they had to glue it all together. The only comparandum I know of for this vessel from Egypt is one from Afghanistan. It's just incredible that these remarkable glass vessels have survived in two of the most remote corners of the ancient world. And you can see your Retiarius here on the right with his big shoulder guard on his neck there, and he's fighting the Sekuto, who's the fellow with their helmet on. But you see over here this figure who's clearly not in combat because he's wearing a tunic, which is not a helpful garment if you're fighting. He is the referee. And that's another detail that of course, Hollywood is going to ignore, namely that these fights are always refereed. And we are starting, we are starting to learn the rules. I have not put into this, this show, but I can tell you about uh, some plaques that were found about eight, uh, 12 years ago now in Italy, where we have two gladiators who've each won their fight stepping on the foot of their opponent, on the hand, rather, of their opponent who's down on the ground. That must be permitted. You want to step on his hand so that he's not going to fish around for his sword and get you from below. Clearly a permissible move. Now, this is interesting. There are two of these mosaics. They're from the Via Appia outside Rome, and they're now in Madrid in the museum. Um, I'm just going to show you one. It's a floor mosaic. Uh, it's, you know, would fit kind of in front of this screen. It takes a bit more room than that. And you read it from below, the lower register to the upper register, because you've got to flip it over 90 degrees mentally. You read what's in front of you and then what's further away. So clearly, I would say, clearly, this guy is likely to defeat that guy. Because this is your retiarius with his shoulder guard, and he's already thrown his net over the opponent. That poor fellow is all encumbered in that netting, OK? And this fellow's trident is going to skewer that guy on the left. And we know who they were, Astyanax, defender of the city, a good Homeric name, 
uh, versus Calendio, if you read across there. But there is this ominous symbol next to Calendio's name, the circle with a slash through it, which the Romans thought of as a black theta, the letter for death in Greek. And it means the guy is going to die. Now, remember what I said, they're so expensive. Most of the gladiators who are defeated are reprieved because they're so expensive. If you mess up so terribly that you lose all status and all respect, then you might be polished off. That clearly happened to Calendio because we've got this sign. If we then go to the upper register, a Styanax wicket, a Styanax one, there he is standing there, net and all, sword drawn, and look what's happened. Oops, darn, sorry. I'm getting too excited here. <laughs> look what happened to Calendio. Look at all these red streaks. Can you see them? He's bleeding like mad, and he's gesturing with his little dagger for mercy. But it didn't happen because there's the black theater again. Okay? And there are two referees this time, the um, Summa Rudis and his second on that side. So these are very carefully orchestrated fights with professional referees in charge. Okay? And we, know, we can calculate that probably a gladiator would have only fought about twice a year in public, but trained, of course, all the time. OK, now, another important find, 1993, I think it was, the uh, Austrian archaeologists digging in Ephesus found a lot of bones, a huge number of bones, with terrible wounds all over them. So at first they thought they'd found a military cemetery, and then they found these steely, these tombstones. This is clearly a gladiator. Okay, there's his helmet standing on top of his shield. He's got a palm frond in his hand. He's a victorious gladiator. And the uh, inscription tells us that he was a mermillo, which is a special gladiatorial style, and it was dedicated by his wife, Hymnus. So now we have a lot of bones giving us osteological evidence for the way gladiators were trained and fed. And that has been very instructive. So here you have from uh, the, uh, one of the uh, archaeological publications from the Austrian team a disposition of where the most wounds are on these skeletal remains from Ephesus. And the great, great, great mystery is that the largest proportion are on the skull. But every gladiator except the Retiarius wore a helmet. So how come there are so many wounds on the skull? This is a great problem. I said earlier that those helmets are very, very stuffy and hot and difficult to wear. But if you cast it off while you were fighting, that was tantamount to suicide. So is it the case that the people with the wounds to the head have actually been polished off afterwards as a form of execution by a blow to the head, or what exactly? We're still trying to uh, work out um, exactly what's happened there. But it, me, it demonstrates a point that every piece of evidence solves one mystery and starts another one. Now, let's move on from there to that helmet I was talking about. He, this would have weighed about five kilos, which is a lot to wear on your head when you're trying to fight. And I imagine that the fights were probably timed, uh, although we have uh, no evidence of that. And for many years, people thought that these were probably just parade helmets. But I think now it's generally accepted that people may have actually worn them uh, in combat, which would have added to the stress and the strain. And of course, Pompeii is the place where one has evidence of this kind. You also, at Pompeii, have the epigraphic evidence, these wonderful um, some are inscribed, and many, like this, are painted. These are advertisements. And this is advertising the gladiatorial team of Aulus Suetius Certus, who is edile. He has a special magistracy in Pompeii. And this team will fight in Pompeii on the 31st of May. And there will be a hunt and awnings. You see, he's taking care of the audience. He's giving them an extra frisson. They're going to see animals. And they'll be under the awning. They won't get sunstroke. But it was expensive. He'd, that's the subtext. You know, I'm shelling out. You guys won't even have to sit in the sun. 
because I'm going to have the awning struck, which meant employing more people to uh, take care of it. And one other interesting thing about this is this is painted outside one of the gates of Pompeii. So why does it bother to say that this spectacle will be at Pompeii? It's because that's where you catch the bus in antiquity. So they were obviously expecting people traveling around the circuit in this part of Italy, and they would need to know, well, I must come back to Pompeii on the 31st of May because there's going to be a spectacle here. We have spectacles advertised at Pompeii that will take place as far away as 60 kilometers. So this was a big, big spectacle. As, you know, you would write in your calendar, I must be there on such and such a day because, you know, the eagles are going to play again. <laughs> Won't be the Patriots this time. Good. You also want to keep the audience happy by giving them something to take home, okay? And we have several paintings like this from Pompeii. Basically, what you have here is two taut cables in parallel and then looped through hooks or riggings on these cables, you have two loose cables. And attached to the rings are the four corners of what can best be described as a pillowcase, which is full of all these little bagels and you know, um, dates and things like that. All you have to do is jerk the end of this loose cable, and then that pillowcase will bounce, and all these goodies get scattered among the spectators. And Seneca tells us the time to leave is before this happens because there's such a scrum, okay? <laughs> uh, people don't behave nicely when they might be catching a bagel. And one time Domitian had one of these distributions in the Colosseum and the wrong category, the plebs, caught all the stuff. And the senators and their questions didn't get anything. So you had to do it again the next day. Again, this is a time when the whole community comes together and has to be seen behaving as befits its station. So the virtues of violence are that we are all together in that arena space where we can all focus on the other performing in the arena and we can also feel that our society is in proper order. Now, we know from Pompeii uh, the outcomes of certain fights. Marcus Attilius, up there you can see his name. T stands for Tiro, he was a recruit, and he, V, he wicked, he won. He won against this fellow Hilarus, who'd fought 14 times, he came from, this, from the uh, gladiatorial school of Nero probably, fought 14 times, and he'd won 13 times, he'd won a wreath, that's what that back to front C is there. And he is M, he's missus, he's granted a reprieve. He lost, but clearly he was reprieved. He wasn't executed as a result of his loss. But then there's a sequel. Marcus Attilius, okay, one fight, that's the one we've just seen, one wreath for the one we've just seen, one again. And this time, fascinating, he defeated Lucius Rikius Felix. That is a freeborn Roman with three names. That's not a slave like Hilarus, okay? This must be one of those volunteer gladiators who had fought 12 times and won 12 times, and this time he is reprieved. He slipped up this one time, but he's got a good track record, so he gets reprieved. And look, he's kneeling, and his helmet is sitting right way up. That's the plume. That is the cheek piece. He'd taken it off as a symbol of accepting his defeat, a symbol of submission. And the kneeling is also a symbol of submission. I, we don't know who wrote this, but probably, I would guess, a gladiatorial fan. And you think back to those little lamps that may have been the prized possessions of those fans. Now, just one tombstone. He's such a little guy. He's in Berlin. I've always thought it must be huge, but it's not on display. It's in the, um, in the depot, the, the um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The lager, the, the, the warehouse uh, of the museum in Berlin. And I got in there when I was in Berlin in 2014. And it's tiny. It's up to my knee. But what I find so moving about it is that his name was originally written up here. 
but it's completely abraded, so we don't even know who he was. But there's one thing we know about him. What do we know about him? We know how many times he won. He won four times. He's got four reeds. They can't be space fillers decoration, otherwise there'd be one down here. So somehow, 2,000 years later, his track record is still impressing us. And that kind of, you know, there's a certain justice in that. But this is what I mean about the fact that they're not at all trying to hide that gladiatorial profession. There is an, a paradox there that these people who were slaves are perfectly happy, or their successors and their family members are perfectly happy to recognize what they did uh, in their lifetime. Now, yes, there were female gladiators. This is the only pair we know of by name, uh, and they are um, <coughs> um, uh, uh, Achillea and um, Amazon. Their names are written down there. Good speaking names, okay, must be their stage names, because Amazon obviously is a good name for a female fighter, and so is the female form of Achilles. Okay, the greatest of the Greek heroes. And I think they'd fought to a draw because I think these are their helmets down here. They are standing, um, and it says actually in Greek, apelothesan, so they were granted a reprieve. They must have fought to a draw. They, neither of them could defeat the other one. And their helmets are down there for the sake of those who can't read that they had fought to a draw. It's not a tombstone. It may have been one of those series of plaques in the gladiatorial training, training school, the greatest hits of our um, training school, that kind, of, that kind of thing. Good. Now, let's move on briefly uh, to a very interesting find that was only discovered about 10 years ago outside uh, Lepkis Magna in Libya. And this is one portion of a much larger mosaic. So I'm going to show you the uh, two slides of more of the floor. It's that end we're looking at, OK? Then there's a beast display of some sort beneath it. And then the next slide will show you a different angle where our portion is up at the top there. Then there's the beast display. Then a circus scene. And then there's another beast display down here and more gladiators at this end. It's a bath mosaic. And to go back to um, the portion I'm interested in, this is a remarkable work of art, in fact. And when you think about mosaic, it's a crude medium. It's all done with little stones, nothing like as subtle as brush strokes of paint. And what we see here in this remarkable foreshortened perspective is evidently the retiarius, who is lying down and his hand is sort of sprawling over the shield, presumably, of his opponent here, whose helmet has been removed and is lying across the retiarius's trident. And the remarkable thing is that the victor really looks as exhausted as the recumbent uh, opponent. And there's no inscription with this uh, to tell us anything about the occasion, whether indeed it was just imaginary or whether it was a record of something that had actually happened. But um, it is, uh, as I say, a, a unique uh, depiction of the kind of exhaustion that overtakes victory, uh, which is not a, a, a feeling that you get very often uh, with these boastful, I won so many uh, gladiatorial fights types of, of representation. Now, yes, there are beasts, and I have mentioned them. And this is where I want you to think briefly about the economic factor. We know quite a lot about the beast trade. We know it was highly organized in North Africa with uh, companies that had their own logo and were exporting animals uh, to the arenas of Northern Europe, along with olive oil and all sorts of other things. Uh, and this unique representation from Algeria actually shows us how the animals were trapped. So what you start with is a net. Inside the net, you put a lot of bushes so that the net is disguised. And then every so often, you have a little corral of tasty-smelling um, sheep or llamas or something like that. 
Then in front of your shrubbery, you place men behind shields, and the men have flares. Then you have the hunters on horseback who will chase the gazelles and the leopards and the lions into this space. And you know, the occasional hunter may get mauled by a leopard, but that's kind of like you know a capital loss if, if you're running one of these companies. And you have your cage ready with the door open, and it's on a chassis with wheels, as you can see. It's reinforced by this very, very strong metal, pair of metal bars, because that animal, when it gets in there, is not going to be happy. He's going to try and get out. Very frequently, on other representations, we see somebody sitting on top of a cage, poor blighter. He has to drop that door when the animal jumps in there. And then it'll trundle off, you know, to be part of the commerce, the commercial transaction. It's a very interesting representation, no doubt somewhat idealized, but it does um, back up some very obscure arcane literary references we have to the animals being uh, frightened by flame, and it must refer to the flares that are being used to encourage the animals uh, to direct their passage towards the cage. And this uh, from Smirat uh, in Tunisia is a very eloquent mosaic, as you can see, because it's got so much writing on it. There are four leopards, and each of them is named. Each of them is named Luxurius, Romanus, Victor, Crispinus. And they're all bleeding like mad. It's so graphic, the suffering. And they are being uh, defeated by either one beast fighter or a pair of beast fighters. Clearly, one of these two, they also named Bularius and Hila Hilarinus, one of them must have been the opponent of Luxurius. But after Luxurius was basically polished off, he came over here to help the other guy. And this fellow, Megarius, is named twice on the mosaic. And the long inscription is the dialogue between the herald, who's holding this tray with four money bags on it, and the crowd. And each money bag, I hope you can see, has a symbol like our infinity sign, an eight on its side, stands for a 1,000. So if you do the math, um, you're going to get um, um, <coughs> 4,000, right? OK. Um, now, wait a minute. I'm making a mistake here with the arithmetic. Let's just look at the inscription for a second. Um, yeah, what, yeah, that's right, 4,000. Because look at the Latin there says, um, do you think that um, Megarius should pay uh, um, uh, <coughs> 500 denarii per leopard, okay? Um, you can see here we've got um, the denarios quingentos, okay? Pro leopardo, per leopard, 500 denarii. And the crowd say, yeah, way, wonderful, fantastic. But in fact, Megarius has doubled the amount. It was such a wonderful display, and they all died, okay? And they really suffered because there was no SPCA or this sense of animal rights or anything like that. These were dispensable. The Romans didn't know that they were forever changing the ecology of North Africa with uh, this habit. So the price has been doubled because, again, it's that generosity, that munificence that I mentioned earlier, that the person in charge, who is Megarius, is so generous that he can afford to double the fee. And I would imagine that if the leopards had names, somebody was betting on them beforehand. I would guess so. But we have no firm evidence. Now, um, a new find from uh, Kibura in in um, Lycia, which is in uh, the south, southwest quadrant of Turkey. A remarkable find, 27 panels. I can only show you a couple here. This looks very much like a cage on wheels, but it can't have been, because look at the edge. That cage could not move if those are meant to be rollers, because this would prevent it from any sort of movement. And we see the beast fighters jumping over the beasts, we see the beasts being hauled away dead, okay? And then underneath, we've got this innocent little frieze of bears in pairs. It's a remarkable, a very eloquent, but also dumb, because there are no words with it, representation, clearly, 
of a set of spectacles that must have um, been of tremendous resonance in this community. And we fortunately do have another bit that joins up there, but doesn't help us because uh, we don't have this end to see whether that same break was on at this end. And I wanted to show you my favorite of these panels. We don't know if this is three pairs of gladiators or just one pair in sequence, okay? In combat, starting to win, defeated, and there's his helmet, and the artist has made a nice little dip there so that you can see his helmet roll away from the spectacle. As I say, there are 27 of these. Finally, the arena as a locus of punishment. This is the column of Marcus Aurelius, whether or not it was put up in his lifetime, and you can see what happens to the barbarians. They wear, oops, sorry, they wear, sorry, sorry, sorry. They wear trousers, and they get their heads chopped off, okay? In other words, the frontiers are safe. The barbarians can't get us. We're controlling them. And this is part of the resonance of the arena. It's a good space for punishing people because everybody can see it happening. So, my title slide. This bull has got a belly band which would be tightened to make it hurt, and that makes him very angry. It's hard to get the animals to perform. Often they're just too frightened and they don't bite the right person or they don't bite anybody. But um, if you can get them to a certain point of enragement, then you're more likely to get a rise out of them. Depends on your perspective whether you think these two people are lying on the ground or whether they're in midair. Either way, it's not good news for them. Okay? <laughs> there is the person orchestrating the whole thing, the slave, I suppose, who had to perhaps use his walking stick to make sure the right thing happened. And here's an even more less fortunate slave who has to propel this prisoner towards that bull. Notice that he's clearly negroid, clearly negroid. And then the inscription, philoserapis, comp, short for composuit, could either be the signature of the mosaic artist, or it could mean that philoserapis had put the display on, put it together. It's clearly something that was meant to impress, and it lies in a tiny little room in a villa in front of the couch where you would conduct a business conversation. It's a little cubiculum off the peristyle. So while you were discussing some business with a business partner, he had that to look at. This is the worst. I'm sorry about it. At every point where claw or, or tooth is making contact with the prisoner, there's this graphic flow of blood in a row of tesserae. The tesserae have come out of the body of this attendant, but at least we can see that he was wearing sandals, whereas the prisoner wasn't. And the hair is completely different on the two figures. There's clearly some sort of ethnic differentiation being made here. And this was in a private house. And that was a dinner plate. <laughs> we'll wrap up with Zlitan in Libya. The beautiful part of this floor is the central portion. Some of these are the opposite type of, of mosaic with big marble pieces. But of course, we are only interested in this little frieze around the edge because that shows the, the displays of the arena. There was always musical accompaniment, or when I say always, if you could afford it, there was musical accompaniment. A lady playing the organ, you notice, trumpeter, two horn players, all looking this way towards the referee, who's looking that way out of the image, waiting for the crowd to decide, thumbs up, thumbs down, don't ask me which way it went, uh, because this Equus has defeated that one and obviously wants to kill him, because you can see the referee is staying his hand, he's got his wrist there in his hands, and they're waiting for the verdict. And then this is another register which just shows you how many different very specific types of gladiator are depicted, and you can see them bleeding copiously from precisely this big artery under the arm. It's all very, very accurately uh, depicted, or from the same artery behind the knee, 
That's the other place you try and get it from. And the same freeze shows us leopards polishing off prisoners who this time are strapped to poles on top of little chassis with a long handle, which will make the slave perhaps a little less likely uh, to be uh, mauled by mistake. It, there's all this sort of fiendish thought that goes into it. And this poor fellow with his hands up and his eye wide in horror as he's being whipped towards his executioner. But these were people who had actually been condemned to death, not just people hauled off the street. And that will bring us to our final detail, which is those Christians. The Christians, what they'd done exactly, why Christianity was, was, their, was their crime, is still not fully understood. There must have been some sense in which they were upsetting the balance of power between the gods and man, since they were not polytheists. And if only they would sacrifice to the power of the emperor, then they would be let off. It would be clear they weren't Christians and they could go home. And so I just have a couple of quotations from the most famous, probably, of these accounts of martyrdom. And they are written by Christians, so they are somewhat party pre, obviously. But it's the, the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas. And Perpetua uh, tells us in her own voice, uh, as it were, uh, that she was um, brought before Hilarianus, the governor, who had received his judicial powers as the successor of the late proconsul Minucius Timinianus. And he said to me, have pity on your father's gray head, have pity on your infant son, offer the sacrifice for the welfare of the emperors. I will not, I retorted. Are you a Christian, said Hilarianus, and I said, yes, I am. And that was the problem for the Romans, that it didn't work. This terrible threat of death didn't work for these Christians. They wanted to die for Christ. So they bucked the entire system. It didn't work anymore. And we, time and again, we see these governors trying to get these Christians to recant, and they just won't. So when Perpetua and Felicitas were brought into the arena, they were put up against a heifer. And as the martyrologist says, this was an unusual species, but it was chosen so as to match their sex with that of the beast. And so they were stripped naked and displayed draped in nets. But the crowd was horrified when they saw that one was a delicate young girl and that the other was a woman fresh from childbirth with milk dripping from her breasts. So they were brought back again and dressed in unbelted tunics. The problem was not that they were going to be killed by the heifer, but that they were naked. You know, the standards. And then Satyrus was one of the male uh, Christians who was punished with them. Uh, the two animals went wrong and didn't go for him, but the third one was a leopard, and it did. And he was so drenched with blood that the crowd shouted, well washed. So we have this extraordinary sort of layer of protocol. You can't have the women there naked, but you can be thrilled to bits that the guy gets his second baptism in blood. And it's only possible, it's only possible for the crowd to react like that if there is a pecking order whereby the people in the arena who are being subjected to this treatment are different and worthless and threatening. So, virtues of violence. It's really difficult to understand what's going on in the Roman arena. It's really hard. But to them, what they were doing had a logic and they got trapped inside that logic so that I think ultimately it was only when the empire was really threatened by, by uh, enormous uh, financial pressure and perhaps a very gradual shift of taste that this eventually came to an end. But wherever you go in the Roman Empire, you will be treading on top of the places where this happened. I've had a pizza here, oops, <laughs> right there. It was horrible, actually. But, but, that's a Roman arena in Lucca. Under there is the 
viewing space, and that in the arena where I had my pizza is where somebody, where the beast or man died. Thank you.